All right. For those of you who are only children, hang on because you're coming on the ride with us. Since this morning's scripture is all about the relationship between sisters and sibling rivalry, I decided we're going to start out by having a pop quiz to see if you can recognize some famous sets of sisters. Are you ready? All right. Does anyone even know who these famous sisters are? The Andrews sisters, as our youth are looking at me with funny faces. They were a famous singing group in the 1940s. Okay, next. We've got Queen Elizabeth. Do you know what her sister's name is? Margaret, Margaret the Queen of England and her sister Margaret. Okay, next. Ooh, they're looking. Oh, it's the, you're right, Brenda. It's the Gabor sisters. Magda, Zsa, Zsa and Ava, who were known for both theater and television performances, but even more so, they were known for their serial matrimony with Magda married six times, Ava five, and Zsa, Zsa was married nine times. Okay, next. There you go, you got it. It's Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen. These were the famous twins of the Full House series who now have their own private line of clothing. Next. Serena and Venus Williams. Very good, our tennis pros. Next. It's the Kardashian sisters, Kim, Courtney, and Chloe. Now, these ladies are famous for... Well, I don't know what they're famous for, other than making the tabloids with a whole lot of naughty behavior. Okay, and our last one. Kate and Pippa Middleton, the sister duo who rose to fame because of one special royal wedding. So as we can see, sisters have a really unique bond. And they, bet they can be best friends and encouraging each other and the next moment be ripping one another's throat out. As author Linda Sunshine said, she said, if you can't understand why a woman can love her sister dearly and want to wring her neck at the same time, you probably are an only child. Well, I have to say I personally consider myself somewhat of an expert on sisters because I have four of them of my own. Part of what makes sisterhood so unique is that we know how to push one another's buttons through rolling our eyes and door slamming and not so passive aggressive competition. At least that's how it was in my house growing up, despite the 15 year difference between my oldest sister, Cindy, and I. My oldest sister, Cindy, is over here. And she is old, the oldest. She is also disabled. So she was the sweet and precious one, but don't get it wrong. She was also incredibly cunning. Then you have Sherry, who was the rebel. Lori, who can talk louder than any human being on the planet but has a beautiful voice and sings like a bird. And then you have Linda, who was the studious one, but the biggest drama queen in the family. As I was growing up, as the youngest, often my teachers would say, well, which of your sisters are you the most like? To which I would smile at them and wink, and I'd say, you're just going to have to wait and see. My parents stopped having kids when they hit perfection. <laughs> so perhaps two of the most well-known sister duos that are great examples of the adoration and the irritation that are shared between sisters is found in the Bible. There's two. One group in the Old Testament, one set in the New Testament. Does anybody remember the, who is the set of the Old Testament? Rachel and Leah. And of course, our New Testament sisters today are Mary and Martha. 
Now, what makes both sets of sisters unique is that they are actually competing for the love of two men. Rachel and Leah are competing because they are both passionately in love with Jacob. And Martha and Mary are competing out of a different kind of love, the love of friendship, because they want to be Jesus' best friend. However, all four have their own unique way of outwitting their sister in their relationships. Now, most of us know when we have relationships with siblings, we go about picking sides. But before we pick sides today, we have to remember Mary and Martha were both really good friends of Jesus, even though their personalities were vastly different. It was obvious that as sisters, they loved and cared for one another, but their differences intensified in the moments of deep sibling frustration and the contrast of their characters often took center stage, as we see today when their argument makes the Bible. But while they're bickering today, maybe of just one of many arguments that they might have had, this argument is something that is incredibly important for us to learn from. Because in their moment of sibling rivalry, they were also taught how you are to follow Jesus and how to actually encounter Jesus. Because they teach us if you want to encounter Jesus, you have to stop the busyness and sit at his feet. So let's begin with Martha. Now, the Bible doesn't typically tell us that she was the oldest, but one can pretty much tell by her type A stereotypical, probably a little over-controlling personality, that she was the oldest. Not only does she go out and proactively invite Jesus into her home for a home-cooked meal, she dives headfirst into making sure everything is perfectly executed. Yep. Martha had the idea for a great party, and she had all the skills to pull it off. But unfortunately, she chose not to relax enough to enjoy it because she was distracted by many things. Okay, time for true honesty. How many people here have ever been like Martha? Maybe you're a perfectionist or you want to appear that you have everything all together even when you don't. How many of us here have put our work or our duty before our relationships and we get too busy to stop even for Jesus? Yeah. The unfortunate fact is that today's world pretty much demands that we live a whole lot of Martha in our lives. So now let's look at Mary, because her life was in complete contrast to Martha's. We don't know if she was the middle child or the baby, but other biblical hints lead us to believe that she was the youngest with big brother Lazarus in the middle. Mary, while Martha's life was driven by responsibilities and duties and commitments, Mary led more of a heart-led life where she let her heart lead her and she experienced life in the moment. Now, it was expected back then that women would be in the kitchen preparing the meal for the men and it would have been considered blasphemous for Mary to not only sit at Jesus' feet but to be in the same room with all the guys. Sure, I bet she knew that her choice was going to infuriate her sister by not helping the, in the kitchen, and it probably angered most of the men. But she didn't care because spending time with Jesus was that important to her. Can't you almost picture it? Mary sitting at Jesus' feet with her hands gently folded and a little glow around her and a slight smile on her face as she drank in every word that he was saying. And then you have Martha out working in the kitchen out of love and duty 
to create delicious smells to entice the hungry bellies of her guests. And as the sweat drips off from her brow, she reaches up and dabs it with her apron. It's in this beautiful moment that we hear those famous words of Martha spatted at Jesus. Jesus, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to get in here and help me. All right. So before we throw her under the bus, how many of you have ever said similar words about one of your siblings? Yeah, it was a real fact in my household growing up. It comes with the territory. But rather than scolding Martha, Jesus has a message for her to learn and for us. Because he says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and you are distracted by so many things. And there's only one thing you need. And Mary has chosen the better part. Did you hear that? Did you really hear that? There was no ridicule or condemnation. Jesus carefully teaches Martha that Mary's choice, although it was against what the world was dictating to her and the world's rules, it was the choice that mattered the most to God. Both women, they were just doing their best to try to love Jesus, and one was intent on showing her love and serving Jesus through busyness and duty and what was expected of her. And the other one loved him by dropping what the world expected of her and sitting at his feet. Friends, Martha failed to fully love Jesus that day because she was so busy, she refused to take time to fully invite him into her life. If you want to encounter Jesus, you have to stop the busyness and sit at his feet. Friends, I believe that as Christians, most of us have, we have a really strong desire to live like Mary. But we exist in a Martha world. A world where high expectations and perfection and crazy schedules and demands are a way of life and every single one of us gets caught up in it. We long to take the time to sit at Jesus' feet, but more often than not, we are challenged by our jobs, our kids' activities, our exhaustion or meetings or worldly commitments, all of which keep us back in the kitchen with Martha. And all of a sudden, what we find out is Jesus then becomes a fleeting thought or a gimme prayer. Jesus, gimme this. Help me with that. And suddenly, we don't feel as close to Jesus because we're afraid to hit the pause button on what the world expects of us to sit at his feet. You know what? I get it. I live it. Every day I try to do my best to sit at Jesus' feet. And yet every day life throws at me a set of Martha circumstances where more often than not, I choose to live what the world expects of me and walk back into that kitchen of society's expectations rather than pausing and taking time to get myself right with God and sit at his feet. So perhaps in this moment, Jesus is calling us to hit the pause button on all of the distractions of life and encounter him by sitting at his feet. And we're going to do that together. What we're going to do is I'm going to read a reflection on this passage from the devotional Jesus calling. Words that are spoken as if Jesus himself is speaking them. All I want you to do is pause. Stop. Don't think about what's for lunch or what you have to do. 
Close your eyes if you need to, but let's sit at the feet of Jesus. Come away with me for a while. The world, with its nonstop demands, it can be put on hold. Most people put me on hold, rationalizing that someday they'll find the time to focus on me. But the longer people push me into the background of their lives, the harder it is for them to find me. You live among people who glorify busyness. They've made time a tyrant that controls their lives. Even those who know me as Savior tend to march to the tempo of the world. They've bought into the illusion that more is always better, more meetings, more activities, more programs, more schedules. I have called you to follow me on a solitary path, making time alone with me your highest priority and your deepest joy. It is a pathway largely unappreciated and often despised. However, you have chosen the better thing, which will never be taken away from you. And moreover, when you walk close to me, I can bless others through you. So come, stop the busyness, encounter me, sit at my feet, drink in my love, and learn what it means to truly live. Let us pray. Jesus, you have taught us that the way to an abundant life with you is to keep you in the center of our lives. But so often we make the choice to allow the overwhelming demands of the world take over. And we find ourselves in the kitchen of the craziness of life like Martha. But still in your mercy, you are there and you call us to make a new choice, a choice to come and sit at your feet here and now. Lord, as we walk these days of Lent with you toward the cross and beyond, may we learn what it really means to stop the busyness and to encounter you in all of life. Speak your words to us as we sit at your feet like Mary, and then may we be like Martha and take your words and serve the world. In your name we pray, amen.